Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Evan Davis, uh, presenter of Newsnight. It's good to be here for the latest in our Chatham House Corporate Leaders series. Um, remember, you can tweet during the event, C hashtag CH events. Uh, this is on the record, as you would expect, with a, a crowd of this uh, size. Um, and your phone should be put on silent mode, uh, apart from that. So, um, so Andrew Whitty is our corporate leader today. Been with GSK, or its various uh, configurations, for 30 years, which is extraordinary. Now, my memory of Glaxo was as a research fellow at the London Business School, not really having thought much about it, working out or being told that Glaxo was Britain's most profitable company, indeed one of the world's most profitable company, because it had the world's best-selling drug. Can anyone remember what that was? Zantac, yeah. At that stage, I'd never needed or taken Zantac. I have since, but not, uh, let's not go there. Um, and it was the most phenomenal uh, story. Uh, and Glaxo went on to be Glaxo Welcome, and SmithKline merged with Beecham to be SmithKline Beecham, and then we had Glaxo uh, SmithKline. Um, but since then, there's been quite a big tale of what one might call reversion to the mean, in which you have the world's best-selling drug, uh, you can't keep that up, and companies in all sorts of areas have discovered, uh, you know, recreating that, that hit is very difficult. Glaxo has done, in fact, pretty well. Zantac obviously went off patent and was overtaken by proton pump inhibitors, and along came Adver, uh, an asthma medicine, which has been GSK's best-selling product uh, since it, and it was launched 14 years ago, and it's still GSK's best-selling product. Um, but it's not going to last forever. And so GSK has had a slightly difficult time in the last uh, year or two as it thinks about what it is going to do and what it is for uh, against a background of uh, you know, austerity in Western countries, desire not to pay so much, growth in emerging markets, uh, and such like. Um, well, Sir so Andrew... Basically, the company has not really grown since he took over, maybe a, a marginally, but it's basically the same size it was. Its shares have underperformed since he took over. But I detect a great deal of goodwill to Sir Andrew. Um, his reputation withstood the crisis in China, which we may come to talk about. He's still there, even though uh, Philip Hampton has taken over as chairman, sometimes likened to the Grim Reaper, you know, standing there over your shoulder is this guy who goes into big companies and often makes difficult decisions out of them. But Sir Andrew is a man with a plan and who is making a bet. And this is, will be the start of our conversation. It is that GSK does not just want to be a sort of pharmaceutical company in high price markets. It's also a <coughs> consumer business. Uh, and Andrew will uh, tell us about that. So it's now in consumer products with products like Horlicks in its portfolio, vaccines, and it's in pharmaceuticals, and it specializes in, in one or two areas there, and it famously earlier this year swapped its cancer business with Novartis to, uh, to take on more consumer products. We actually sold it for $16 billion. Right, right, right. We swapped some other things. We swapped some other things, yeah. Let's start on, let's start on that, that plan. Isn't it a bit defeatist to think you can't be a big force in pharma, a bigger force in pharma. Oh, no, I think we'll be a big force in pharma. The, the difference here is we're talking about and rather than or. So it's not an issue of one or the other. It's a question of how to create a more balanced, sustainable approach so that you can do both. So the issue you described around Zantac to Advert to the next thing to the next thing, those are remarkably difficult things to do. I don't know if anybody here can remember who the biggest company in the world was in the drug sector when I joined the industry in 1985. Does anybody know what the world's biggest drug company was? Herxt. Herxt doesn't even exist as a brand name within any drug company now. And it's disappeared because of the massive yeah. pressure and the risk that takes place. So, so we've done very well in that pharmaceutical story. We conti it's, it continues to be a huge business. It's a very important business for us. Where what are you ranked in, in pharma? So forget so consumer products. So we're about products. five or six in pharma, in pharma globally. So you're not counting the consumer product, the Correct, correct. And if, you looked, and if you look, for example, <clears throat> in the emerging markets, so if you looked in the 
let's go east of here and south of here, we sell 50% more volume in those markets than any other company in the world in pharmaceuticals. In pharmaceuticals. Uh, correct. But our average price is not necessarily as high. Right. So what the bet that we're exploring here is twin-fold, actually. One is a very big investment on R&D innovation. And people have kind of slightly said, in it, frankly, in a reasonably simplistic way, it's either innovation or it's volume. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is innovation, big bet there, we're still spending three, three and a half billion pounds a year on yep. research in vaccines and pharmaceuticals. But we also want to find ways to ensure that we're building a volume platform across the world, A, for that innovation to be deployed against, and B, within that volume platform, clearly opportunities to grow businesses, vaccines, where typically we sell products of five to 10 US dollars per patient, consumer healthcare products where perhaps the price point is similar. What that allows us to do is to make a contribution to healthcare on a very broad basis, it allows us to build a volume driven business, decent margin, decent opportunity, great growth, alongside and in addition to the innovation business. And actually today's innovation is tomorrow's established product. Again, people yeah. in the sector often talk about, well, why don't you get rid of your established products? Why don't you think, and we've looked at those sorts of ideas, but when it really boils down to it, everything is a continuum. Right, but what, 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 what the, the puzzle has been for some people is what connection there is or what synergy there is, what GSK <coughs> is for. I mean, if you literally are getting volume with Horlicks, mm -hmm. how does that benefit the vaccine business or the pharma business. I mean, well, it, it, it's... it's uh... Well, Horlicks, so you pick a good example at the extreme <clears throat> perimeter. Right. And, I, ob I, you know, obviously, I'm not going to try and defend that Horlicks is intimately critical for us to discover the world's fastest growing HIV drug, which we've just launched, <laughs> right? right? Clearly. So, however, even for Horlicks, the fact that GSK has an outlet in every village in India 500,000 outlets distributing Horlicks. The second most consumed beverage in India after tea is Horlicks. Creates a tremendous brand name presence across India. Now, alongside that business, we have a pharmaceutical business, which again, prices for India. A third of everything we sell in the world, we sell in India. Can you believe that? A third of everything we sell in the world, we sell in India because we've identified the volume price sweet I, spot no, and those two things sit together. You need what distribution, is the, what is you need the, What presence. is the synergy? Because people are not buying your pharma because they like the name GSK. They're buying the pharma because it suits the thing that the condition... No, in emerging have. markets where there are many, many choices, dozens of generics, very little intellectual property protection, what people look for is a brand they can so trust. brand matters. Brand in, matters. People, walk, people get a prescription, they go to the pharmacy, the pharmacy says, do you want the local generic? Do you want a brand, an international brand? What do you want? And when you say GSK in those countries, people will say, no, I want the GSK product. Why? Because they've seen GSK brand elsewhere. By the way, it works the other way. If you watch TV commercials here in Britain for Sensodyne, you'll see GSK referenced on those ads. Why? Because we know that people who buy consumer healthcare products right. are They want impressed. it to feel like it's a medical product. Right. Now, yeah. also, it's not coincidental that almost all, in fact, the five or six biggest OTC consumer healthcare companies are part of drug companies. The, the norm is this structure. This isn't the aberrant structure. Now, I'm not saying it would never change, no. but the norm, and why is that? Because most of the OTC products were once innovative products. Believe it or not, paracetamol was once an innovative pharmaceutical. <laughs> right, right, it was right. a Zantac of its day. It's now an OTC product, but it started off there and it is, moved down is the sen Is Sensodyne a, a, an innovative product or is Sensodyne a toothpaste? With, I mean, uh, I Sensodyne is a category creating <clears throat> consumer brand. It's right. a phenomenal product. I use it, right. many people use it. It's mm. a billion pound product. It's defined sensitivity as the premium part of toothpaste. What's fascinating about Sensodyne is it's come from a pharmaceutical company. It's got in it a whole series of new technologies which allow it to operate the way it or right. does what it does. The competition, the established players, continuously keep launching their sensitive toothpaste against Sensodyne. All it does is grow Sensodyne because Sensodyne is so it's synonymous the with the category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a, it is a really a phenomenal product. So, so I mean, the, the reason why I was trying to get at the synergy hmm. was that there are people who think this company doesn't need to to exist, basically, right. and you a big American company, Pfizer sometimes mentioned, others are mentioned, to take over the pharma business, and you would hive off the, the, the back, the, the 
you might keep vaccines separate or you might put them into pharma, but you'd hive off the consumer products into something separate. Give us the sort of the elevator pitch as to why you, you don't think that should happen. Is it, is it branding, basically? Well, so, so first of all, you have to look at all three pieces. So the pharmaceutical business and the vaccine business share completely the same yeah. global so, distribution. Yeah. So when you say, oh, we could just hive off or add on, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that easy. And you would end up with uh, the recreation of a completely duplicated distribution, global distribution capability, yeah. which yeah. today is totally integrated and shared. Right. And I think would be, frankly, very a very suspect set of decisions to lead you in that direction. The consumer business, there are real synergies in terms of products which switch. This year, we launched Flonase OTC. Flonase is a product that was discovered by Glaxo scientists in the mid-1980s. It was launched in 1990. I was the product manager when it was launched. We launched it. It became a billion-dollar pharmaceutical product in the US. It went off patent four years ago, and we launched OTC this year. We put 26 miles of shelving into the pharmacies across America. It was the number one and number two best-selling product in health for the, fir for the first part of this year, and we sold 150 million pounds of over-the-counter Flonase. If that was all because the consumer business belongs to GSK. So you have a direct synergy there. You have a branding synergy that I've just described, mm -hmm. which is very important internationally. And we also have opportunities where we've been able to bring our pharmaceutical pharmacy, because remember, pharmacists are a key customer audience for the pharmaceutical business. Every time you take a prescription, yep. you go to a pharmacy. Our OTC business, number one customer is the pharmacist. So you have tremendous integration of the channel. Now, those are the areas of synergy. And of course, the fact, and then the last one I should say, actually, OTC manufacturing is pharmaceutical manufacturing. So the factories that make the pharmaceutical products are very they, likely that making the OTC yeah, products, yeah. and they're certainly making them to the same quality standards, which is, again, an important aspect. Now, could you envision it being separate? Of course you could envision yeah, it being yeah. separate. The question is what creates the maximum value. No, now, no, what okay. we've, but you well, made a good case, yeah, the, the manufacturing synergies, the brand synergies, and yeah. some of the and distribution. I, and I've made it very yeah, clear. No, I'm not, this isn't a religious fact, right? I mean, you don't, you don't have to be religious about it. But we believe at this point in time that the opportunities for growth in these businesses, the synergies we're extracting and the margin we're building, particularly after the transaction with Novartis, creates tremendous medium-term shareholder value opportunity. Now, once you go through that phase, who knows? Maybe, maybe then you look again and you say, OK, maybe there's some other way you can do it. But certainly for the next couple of years, you would certainly take the view right. that while we've got these opportunities, we're the right owners to take advantage of them. Now, the, uh, one of the premises underlying what I've called your bet, you know, on, yeah. on, on the consumer business, is, is pressure on pricing in advanced economies, yes. essentially. Just tell me what's going on there, because I, is this nice in the UK and equivalent initiatives everywhere? Is it Obamacare? What, what do you see as the, the driver there? So, so, so we're just back to first principles. You've got a situation where on a global basis, the one thing we're not short of, and it's an unfortunate fact of humankind, right, but we're not short of demand for medicine. Every day there are more people on the planet. Every day they get older. Every day their expectations for healthcare go up. That is essentially an exponential explosion in volume demand. And as more countries become, if you will, engaged in healthcare, it accelerates. Right. So, so that's a huge aspect. There is a tradition of the industry, and not just the drug industry, but the medical tech industry, and frankly, most of healthcare, to be completely focused on the rich developed countries, the US and Western Europe, and price has been a very big part of that. There has been a very strong reliance on price, especially in the US, over that period. That is creating great tension. Now, this tension broke in Europe, or began to break in Europe about eight years ago, and in the last eight years, European prices have gone only downwards. You've got to remember, when you launch a new product in Europe in the pharmaceutical sector, A, you have a two, maybe up to a two-year negotiating period before you're allowed to launch. And I can't remember the last time a price was increased in Europe. They always go down. There's all sorts of interesting side effects of that. But that's what happens. They always go down in Europe. What, we're, what we've seen in America is they've typically gone up, at least at the gross level. Now, there's a very interesting 
lack of transparency in the US marketplace, which means actually what may be happening in reality at the net level is not what's reflected you mean in the headlines. So through discounts? Through discounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But clearly, as healthcare yeah. has grown to 17% of GDP in America, as you have the Affordable Care Act brought in, as you see the shift in accountability to the provider network, so the hospitals are taking more responsibility for outcome, you've got an enormous number of new dynamic pressures opening up. Some are political, some are legislative, but a lot is about market behavior. Actually, the, the market in the US is the biggest driver of change. That is very dynamic right now. It began about a year and a half ago. We got hurt in the first waves of that, one of the problems we had last year. Mm -hmm. But it's now beginning to move, I think, in a much more mm, almost industrial approach. And I think we're going to see some dramatic changes over the next several years in the US. What does that mean? It doesn't mean the US prices are going to collapse. It doesn't mean the US is going to become a terrible market. But it does mean that it's going to be harder to get the prices we've had in the past. It does mean the market's going to be more selective. And it will require more innovation to win. What's the strategic response? We've got to think through our pricing strategy for that market. We need to commit to innovation. So on November 3rd in New York, we're going to update the street on our R&D pipeline, and they're going to see that 80% of the drugs in the labs at GSK are first-in-class drugs. We've decided to take the development risk, the innovation risk, because if we don't, we don't think you will be able to get a decent price in the US by coming along with a product that's fourth or fifth to market. We really have to go for the first in class, and you're going to see a lot of that stuff on November 3rd. That's one part of the response. The second part of the response is to say we need to not be so dependent on, on US, US as the only driver of growth. Because, you know, frankly, you read the first five pages of the newspaper, and you get one impression about what the world's doing in terms of anxieties about affordability, about anxieties about price. And then you get to the stock market page, and it's like another world. And eventually, these two worlds come together. I think since the beginning of the summer, it's become increasingly clear that what I indicated was a real cause for reason to think is beginning to play out. You're seeing it politically. You're seeing it in some of the criticism of some of the more extreme behaviors in the marketplace. And I think we will continue to see this story develop. It's not over the next three months. It's not a, you no, know, no, it's no, not a snap it's a thing. Secular trend. This is a it's tidal a, yeah. shift that's yeah. going to start to happen. And companies, I believe, need to have a fundamental strategy which, which gets ready for that risk and needs to be engaging with a pricing philosophy which is, frankly, more empathetic about the various balances right. which different stakeholders need to is have. Is there not, I mean, it, one of the debates that's absolutely fascinated me, and I, I, I just don't think it's had enough attention, it's just, couldn't we price pharmaceuticals more sensibly? I mean, it seems very odd that you'll have someone going along to NICE and saying, this is the price, NICE considering it says, frankly, we're not going to buy it at that price. And that seems to be the end of the discussion. Well, I mean, maybe they do have another discussion, but isn't it, let's work out what the value of this drug is, Maybe let's distinguish between when it works and when it doesn't work, and then we don't have to have an argument about how often it works. We can just tell when it's worked, and we will have one price for when it works and a different price for when it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, we could just have a, a much well, better well, though, outcome. Here, I mean, I think it? it's important not to be just obsessed with the UK or no, NICE. No, indeed, I mean, but, NICE but, is a, but, but as a model of a kind of... Yeah, um, that you might the UK better. actually is a very weak adopter of innovation. Mm. It's, it's always been pretty slow. It's particularly slow yeah. over the last, last decade. And so, uh, actually, this debate is being played out in other countries, in the US. Yeah. Actually, places like France, where, you know, for years, we've had models exactly like that. So we've had products in France where, at the end of every year you figure out how many people used your drug, what kind of patient were they, yeah. and we essentially get paid by the French government a different price according to which type of patient right. it was because they valued it differently. Because right. for some drugs, it makes a, for some patients, they got a big benefit, some are middle and some not very much. It's just a law of averages. And you can structure price deals that way. That's exactly, I've for a long time been an advocate of flexible pricing approaches right. to create a suite of mechanisms which would allow us together with the payer to figure out ways to give the patient the benefit of the doubt on the drug. The problem with these very um, almost monopsonistic price negotiations is it's binary. 
either everybody gets access or yeah, nobody, or nobody gets, gets access. Yeah, yeah. And we need a price mechanism which is titrated much more to where the benefit curve is mm. because, not, because some people will benefit enormously, some won't. So we can do those things. In the US, it's a bit more challenging because there's a bit of a lack of transparency. There are a lot of cross-cutting regulations which make it quite difficult to innovate in the space. But you've got to believe that over time, the notion, if, if, and it's a big if, actually, but I think, it's a, I, think it's a, I think people would agree with it broadly. If you want to continue to incentivize shareholders to put capital yeah. at risk to discover new technologies, then the logical thing to do is to put in place mechanisms which incent that innovation. Needs, you need to have a mechanism to protect the reward, but... Yeah we need to put that into a much greater context of affordability. You need to price so, discriminate, essentially, between the people who can pay and the ones who can't pay. Or at least you have a mechanism, to or to, you, whether you price discriminate or you have a mechanism which is, allows that to be yeah. modulated at the end of the day, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. What we need to do, though, is we need to have a conversation about innovation, value, and affordability, right. not just two of the three. Because if we do two of the three, either it becomes too industry-centric and it alienates the stakeholder and it's going to break the right. system, or it becomes too to payer-centric yeah, and it's and going then, to kill then, the then innovation then be, engine. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. need to get these balances right. Mm. How do we take the pressure off this? We have to take the pressure off the US being the only engine right. for innovation. Right. How do you do that? By investing in emerging markets, by essentially beginning slowly but surely to spread the return curve across the world. Everybody's fixated on the drug industry depends on price. It's not true. The drug industry depends on returns. Returns are a function, obviously, yeah, of, of the price, and price the cost volume, yeah, yeah, and time, yeah. because yeah. we're an IP-fenced industry. Yeah. It's time as well. Those are the dynamics of a more interesting pricing conversation. What and do you I say to those, to though, who say, look, if you'd stuck with innovation as the key driver of growth and you'd expected high price, there are drugs out there, the, the, the hep C drugs, for example, that are... Yeah, of course. Achieving phenomenally high prices. I mean, are they sustainable? Like $80,000 treatment, $90,000? Listen, a product like that is that those things come along. I can't remember the last time somebody invented a pill that cured a virus. I mean, and those guys deserve a tremendous, the scientists who came up with that deserve a tremendous, right. you know, accolade. It just never happens. Right. It's, an, an, you know, good for them. And, a, and it's a, fun, you know, for everybody in the world who has hepatitis C, what an, you know, Basically, a, there's a cure. Lucky for them, they lived in this era it. where somebody yeah, came right. up with a pill, which yeah. in 12 weeks, can, I mean, it's phenomenal, right? Um, I think from where we would sit, first of all, you can't predict what you're going to discover when you're going to discover it. It's, that's why it's called discovery, right? You, you know, if it, was, if it was so predictable, it would be called development. Right? It's not development, it's discovery. These things require a whole set of circumstances difficult to... Managed. To give you an idea of that, we've, we're very pleased with some progress we've made at GSK around genetic target profiling. We've spent a lot of time working with people like the Sanger Institute, Welcome Institute, and others to really innovate our thinking around genetic profiling. This is kind but, of personalized medicine. This so is trying kind of to understand with... what target drives yeah, a disease. Right. Not necessarily oh, right. personalized, no, okay, not personalized no, but okay. really trying to get under the skin of what drives the disease. We've made some great progress. What we figured out is if we can use that technology to spot the target, we have a high chance of progressing. You know what that's done to our failure rate? Or success rate, I'll say it this way. It's me. doubled our success rate from the very beginning to the very end, from 2 to 4%. <laughs> right. Now, well, that's actually, from result. an economic point yeah, of view, yeah. doubling your success rate is gigantic. But from 2 to 4 just tells you what the yeah. risk profile is here. So we, the sensible thing to do is to have a big bet, and again, just to put the facts on the table, we have more drugs in development than we've ever had in the history of the company. We have more vaccines in development than we've have ever had. We're spending as much as most people would sensibly expect you to spend. What we aren't doing is we're not spending as much on buildings. We don't have as much lab square footage because we just don't need it anymore. Right. Um, we should just talk about antibiotics. I know there are health, one or two health people here, but... It does seem to me very strange that we haven't managed. We, fa we face what we're told is one of the most incredible crises in, in, in a sort of backward step, a regressive step in healthcare, and we haven't worked out a mechanism through pricing or direct payments in which we've incentivized people like your company, your company, to invent new antibiotics. What has gone wrong there? I mean, there must be either a political dysfunction, a corporate dysfunction, a shareholder dysfunction. What? 
Well, I think, I mean, just to update you on where we're at, and, and people are going to see some of this on November 3rd, um, there, have only been, there have only been two new classes of antibiotics discovered and launched. Uh, every week, some, but you read in a newspaper right, that somebody's invented, yeah. but you know what, they, all, they quite often fail. In fact, they've all failed, except for two. Only two classes have made it all the way through post-registration onto the marketplace in 40 years. You're going to hear on November 3rd, we have a third one. Right, so we haven't, we've been highly active in antibiotic research all the way through this period. You're going to see something called a type 2 tomposorize inhibitor, I can't even say it, or a, a gyrase inhibitor, which is a much easier way to describe this thing. Uh, highly effective, developed against plague. Now, you might know that there isn't, thank goodness, a lot of plague in the world, but we've developed it, particularly in that space. First of all, I think it's a fantastic example, A, of the scientific uh, achievement of GSK, discovered by GSK researchers in collaboration with Bard in the US, but by GSK researchers, um, developed, and, and we now know we have a highly effective new class of antibiotics, and it's shortly going to go into development for a series of more widely but difficult to treat antibiotics. This will be a classic case of an antibiotic which will be reserved for use. It's not going to be widely used because people are going to want to keep it just in case there's an outbreak of these very difficult to treat conditions. Now, what are the real issues in this? People get very fixated on the financial incentivization. Development, developing antibiotics is difficult. Uh, you've got to start there first. Most of the classes that failed, failed either because the in vitro predictions weren't true right. or they were toxic, i.e., they hurt the human. Yeah, as much, you know, but you, they yeah, killed the bug, what, but yeah, they didn't yeah, do you yeah, any yeah, good yeah. either. So there's a, the, that really, the technical challenge should not be underestimated, right? It should not be underestimated. And we need to have, and this is where the US have been phenomenal in the way in which NIH, BARDA, and others have deployed their energies to try and encourage the base academic research that's needed to move it forward. We have a great partnership with them in this particular field. It's very, very important. That's the first part. The second part is, frankly, we all need to stop talking about the theoretical and take real examples to solve. So what we're going to do with this drug, we haven't wasted a lot of time talking to people about how we're going to pay for it and all of that. So let's develop the drug. If we can develop the drug, once we know what it is, let's then go talk to people and say, now how are we going to manage this? So we have a real case. So actually, I think it's entirely logical that the GSK gyrase inhibitor may have a particular funding mechanism, a particular way of being dealt with, which might be very different from company X's new ABC inhibitor, right? But let's, let's build responses to the opportunities we have. Right? Instead of wasting all this but time so to just to, be, just to cut to the chase, you're not saying we can't invest in antibiotics unless you pay us. No, we'll invest. We will back. We I, I'd heard that this was just never made commercial sense. Antibiotic research it is difficult. It's expensive. It lasts for three days, and then people stop taking it. Much better we to be looking after so, thinking about diabetes because so that lasts Antibiotics a is a very heterogeneous group. So I've just told you about yeah. the brand new yeah. plague yeah. drug initially for plague. Uh, it won't make very much money, at least not initially, but we're doing what we think we should do, which is we're deploying our scientific knowledge to, to make right. a breakthrough in so this space. So you're not doing it for the shareholders. This one's for the team. This no, this will the, be, right. no, this is for the shareholders. Why? Because, yes, it starts with plague, but it will potentially be used elsewhere right. Right. Because, it's been de because we're collaborating with people like Bard and others, we're able to move it through much more quickly. So the cost of development is much lower than right. you would anticipate. Right. This is going to be good for everybody involved here. And I think a lot of people care not just about what the earnings per share is of the company. They care about what the company does beyond that. And I think there is a much broader set of conversations about what drug companies should or shouldn't be doing. So that's the first part. But let me, let me take you to the other end of the spectrum. We also make another antibiotic called Augmentin. In 2004, the patent expired in Augmentin. We made 400 metric tons of, um, of Augmentin in Irvine in Scotland. Last year, 2014, we made 1,000 tons of that antibiotic. And we sold a billion pounds worth worldwide. So that's a, you know, and honestly, if you said to me, Andrew, would you like to get rid of the Augmentin business? I'm not on your life. I love that business, <laughs> fantastic business. And, you know, you can see from within it, we feel that the antibiotic space is a good one for us right. to work in. And we continue to innovate the augmenting process just as much as we research the breakthrough products. I'm going to open to the floor in a second because it, it, we do want to leave half the session for the audience to, 
to, to ask questions. I'll just finish with a kind of a general reflection, because it is interesting, and it's nice when you talk about the drugs and, and you know, what they cure and what, what the treatments are. Don't you find it very interesting that the pharmaceutical industry has a bad reputation? I mean, we read about the China uh, corruption, we read about profits, and we read about profiteering, and it is an industry that saves lives. No one can dispute that. It's an industry that produces you know, pills that are completely transforming for people's, people's welfare. And yet, it's actually not a terribly popular industry. I just wonder if you could explain that paradox. Is it that you've done bad things and you, you, that's been recognized? Or is there somehow something the public don't understand about the industry that makes them feel negative about it? I mean, it or am, am I wrong in thinking that there's no, a slight, I mean, I mean, slight rumor around Clearly, that, yeah, you know, yeah. like, uh, so first of all, I think we are slightly alongside any big industry yeah. or any big institution. Big business, yeah. yeah it's negative, there is a yeah. bit of that. Um, we are big companies, we're global, mm -hmm. and li again, like any big organization, you're vulnerable to your weakest link in the organization. So if, if something goes wrong, and particularly in today's world, social media world, mm -hmm. um, you know, I often think about what it must have been like to run a global company in the 70s, where it, you, know, you had to wait for the ship to arrive <laughs> to find out what happened on the other side of the world. Today, you know, you've, Wall Street Journal calls you before before you've even heard about something inside your own company. So there's a, I do think there is a certain phenomena where, and you see that across many, many you look at it in politics, you look at it in newspapers, the hacking uh, stories, yeah, yeah, yeah. all things like that. So I think there's a bit of that. I do think, let's be honest, nobody wakes up in the morning hoping that they're going to need a drug from GSK. You don't wake up in the morning thinking, actually, if it's a really good day, I might be, might be diagnosed to be ill right, and I might right. need a drug. So that is, we're not aspirational in that sense. <laughs> so you start by saying, actually, I've got some bad news because right. I've been told I'm not very well. They then said, we might have some good news because there's something we can help you with. And then in some countries, I have to pay for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And as a, or in Britain, you might go to the doctor and they say, actually, I'd like to give you this, but nice have said I can't. Mm. So then there's a whole series of reasonably negative concepts yeah. around pricing, around illness. Yeah, all yeah, of that yeah. illness. There was a yeah, bit of that. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got, actually, we do occasionally make mistakes. I mean, you know, things go wrong. We have inevitably in pharma, in anything, as soon as you, I often think, you know, we, we, of course, we go through all the processes with the regulators to get a drug to be as safe and effective as it can possibly be. But the reality is, Every time a human takes a drug, it's like a clinical trial. You don't really know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Everybody can react a different way. So on the one hand, what, what is the story of the drug industry? The story of a drug industry is wonder drugs. And on the other mm -hmm. hand, it's danger drugs. And, and those are the two extremes that we have. It's kind you're, of so unavoidable. You're, you're saying, you know, there are bad apples and it goes wrong. I mean, is that right? Or is it, for example, in the China case, was it that there was bad apple and it went wrong? Or was it that that was normal behavior in certain markets and it just got called out in that particular case well, for reasons that... that I, so I don't want to... I, for yeah, yeah, obvious yeah, yeah, reasons, yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, going to yeah, get yeah, into yeah, yeah. all of but the detail But was it normal that, behavior? It, was that behavior actually something or was it just a slight extension of behavior? Well, is, I think, I think the bigger question is where do you want to go forward? Now, if you look at what we... No, but just answer that one. I mean, whether well, it was, no, there's no doubt. If you, if you ask the more general question, so there have been concerns over the years of is the drug industry transparent enough? Yeah. What's the relationship of the drug industry with doctors, yeah. all of those are kind of concerns. Let's call them concerns, concerns or you yeah, know, reasons yeah. for anxiety, whatever they are. And sometimes they've spiked up into real issues. What we've really tried to do, and we're beginning to see some other companies, I think, follow in a similar direction, is we said, you know what? We get that. We get that transparency is a cause of concern. People are worried that something's been hidden. But we didn't think there was, but people are, and perception is everything, right? So what did we do? We came out and said, we will publish every single bit of clinical data we have in the company. We, we are the only company to do that at this point. Every single thing. If a researcher wants to know exactly what the data was on patient number, not all, all anonymized, yeah. but on patient number 1002 in clinical trial 87 from 2002, we will give them that information. Mm -hmm. All the way through... So we'll do that. We've said we will stop all payments to physicians to speak on behalf of the company. It's perfectly legal practice. I think everything the company's so, done but in but that this space, is but a we recognition, and, I, and, I, and, I, and there, there is a lot you've done to, to you know, 
present these things differently, but I'm, it is a recognition that it was pretty dysfunctional before. Well, it? I think it's a recognition to say... publishing data, to me, honestly, doesn't seem like a great achievement. It just seems to me that that's what you should be doing with data. Except, and interestingly not enough... not bribing doctors seems like a thing you would just do. Uh, well, and, so and I wouldn't say it's bribing doctors. Well, I think I mean, it's, but perfectly, it's on that fuzzy boundary. It's perfectly it's a, legal yeah, it's, yeah. to pay... If, so if you went to a physician yeah, and said, yeah, yeah. would you expect to be paid for speaking on behalf of them? They would probably say yes. Yeah, and actually, yeah. in most countries in the world, it's perfectly legal. Yeah. However, it, there are risks that it can be abused People can do, right. uh, can make mistakes, and there are risks that there is a misperception. Now, just to your point on publication, do you think academics are mandated to publish their data? No, 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 no. I mean, I understand. Do you think, do you think universities publish all their failed no. studies? No, no, they I don't. Mean, no, I know, and I think and, there's a but huge we do. issue around but universities and replicability and all of these right. kinds of things. So, so yeah. your point, your observation is not really okay. on the money. I okay. think the point is there is a general sense in the world where not everything historically has been published. Academia doesn't work to that yeah. standard. Yeah. We've taken the view that there is that time has changed. It's time to look forward. It's time to fundamentally do things differently. That's why we made those commitments several years ago. It's why we've li liberalized our approach to intellectual property in the emerging markets for a very similar but different set of reasons, because there was a concern that IP was somehow getting in the way of access. That's why we liberalized right. our approach in the emerging markets, and it's why we've changed our approach to the way we interact with physicians. It's why we've changed the approach yeah. to how no, we no. pay our representatives. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think I'm very proud of a company that's prepared to try and move forward and fundamentally, <coughs> uh, quite brave actually, fundamentally, engage in a different business model, not just to how the rest of my peers operate, but how almost everybody in this healthcare industry operates.